What's happening guys, Keith here with another Impact Wrestling Review. So tonight we're going to take a look at the Redefined episode, which took place on August 30th. Uh, very good episode, I enjoyed it. Um, this is the first time I am doing a review in a little while. Uh, last week I was away at a wedding, out of state, so that was fun. Uh, I did, however, purchase tickets to Bound for Glory. And this will be my first Impact Wrestling event, so I am very excited for that. Unfortunately, when tickets went on sale is when I was getting ready for the wedding, so I was only able to obtain general admission tickets, but I plan to get there pretty early. So if any of you guys are going to be there as well, let me know in the comments section below, and maybe we can get a meetup going. So let's talk about Redefined. Um, we got a nice video package to open the show, uh, and it also had a special opening video. Uh, very well done. Impact always hits it out of the park with their video packages, graphics. That department is very solid. So we open the show with the X Division Championship match with Brian Cage defending against Phoenix. Phoenix had Pentagon at ringside. I did like seeing him support his brother in a pretty big match. Probably his biggest match in Impact Wrestling. Actually, he was in the title match at... Um, Redemption, so I guess maybe his second biggest match, but Pentagon was there anyway. So, we noticed Brian Cage had some new attire, 50-50 black and white. I liked it. Uh, this match was very good. They gave it a lot of time, probably gave it close to 20 minutes, I would assume. Uh, they utilized the ramp a lot, and I noticed that since the ramp has come into play since we've been taping in the Rebel Complex, that it has been used a handful of times this match, it seemed like they used it a lot to their advantage, and they did some good stuff with it. Um, Phoenix is always a delight to watch. I can always say that after watching one of his matches, uh, he always seems to pull out some innovative maneuvers, along with Brian Cage, too. Uh, but I must say, Phoenix's kicks were spot on. Very good stuff. Um, so throughout the match, we saw a couple crazy things. Brian Cage hits a brutal, he had Phoenix in like the torture act position, then dropped him in like a modified Death Valley driver. Looked br brutal. Very nice. Um, we did see Phoenix counter the Weapon X into a sunset flip. Very nice maneuver. Uh, Cage ended up hitting an F5, and the way Phoenix landed, he was perfectly able to put his foot on the bottom rope. Good stuff there. Uh, we did have a scary spot, which was beautiful at the same time. Phoenix went for a suicide dive onto the outside. Brian Cage catches him, almost loses him in the audience, but then hits him with a suplex. Very nicely done. Brian Cage posted on Twitter last night after the show saying that uh, someone on 205 Live was stealing his moves, so he was going to bust it out again. Um, good stuff. But in the end, Cage ended up hitting a power bomb off the top rope, very similar to the Awesome Bomb from Mike Awesome years back. Um, and he got the victory there. It was not the most pretty-looking move, but very effective. Uh, so after the match, OVE came out and attacked Pentagon Jr. and Phoenix. Brian Cage was on the stage. He kind of looked back to the ring, said, you know what, I'm not going to get involved. They were getting beat down, so Cage came in. I think he hit Jay Chris with the drill claw, and I think he was going to hit it on Sammy, and then Dave pulled him out. So, good stuff there. Um, we learn next week it will be OVE, Sammy Callahan, and the Chris Brothers facing off against Zachary Wentz, Trey Miguel, and I believe Ace Austin. So, what I would like to see, I think this would be really cool, obviously pushing Sammy Callahan as a cult leader, and that's how they should go with OVE, just kind of being a cult, uh, much like we saw a couple weeks ago when... Uh, Sammy made Dave shave his head to look like him. He said, we are going to look more like a family. Uh, what I would like to see them do is defeat the three men next week. Maybe capture them, something like that. But anyway, so we head over to the Mexico tapings in a couple weeks. Maybe we get this six-man tag of OVE versus Brian Cage, Pentagon, and Phoenix. All of a sudden, we get Zachary Wentz coming out. Desmond Xavier, Trey Miguel. I don't know if Ace Austin is a part of the group. Um, if you guys want to let me know if he is or not in the comments, that would be helpful. Um, but have them come out, numbers game, and that's how they 
do business just because obviously when you look on paper at OVE versus Cage and Pentagon and Phoenix, it looks like it's a sure thing that Cage and Phoenix and Pentagon would have the advantage, but the numbers come into play and maybe we'll get something like that. Um, but next week's match should be fantastic. The six man, uh, all six of those men, very capable of putting on good matches. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so we go to ringside and Josh Matthews and Don Callis are running down the rest of the card, and we start hearing a We Want Jericho chant from the audience. Now, I don't know what prompted this, if something was said previously, or it was just maybe they were doing an advert for it. Um, But yes, it was very loud and clear, and I think Don made the joke about calling Chris Jericho at that point, or he said Mr. Barry, I don't know, one of those. But interesting stuff there. Um, It seems like... There is a good possibility that Jericho could end up in Impact Wrestling at one point or another, Um, but time will tell. So then we head outside the arena, and Bobo is pulling up in his, uh, I guess he had an Escalade or something like that, and uh, the security guard would not let him into the arena because, well, he's Bobo. Uh, Scarlet gets out of the car, does her thing to the security guard. The security guard gets all flustered and lets him in. Eh, didn't really do anything for me. I do like the Smoke Show segments, um, so even if they just did that one segment throughout the night, I mean, these little segments here don't do much for me, but whatever. Uh, So we get the GWN Moment of the Week, and I put moment in quotations because it's always longer than a moment. Uh, We saw the debut of Drew Galloway, which, again, why are we... Promoting people that are no longer in our company, especially since they're on another company, on TV. Just just one of those things that just aggravate me. And I know it aggravates other people too, so I'm not alone in this. However, after that, they promote Bad Intentions one night only, which is available tonight, Friday. And I thought that was good use of the time, which is really what they should be pushing when they're promoting the GWN. I mean, your own product. Hell, they should be pushing uh, Explosion every week. We had the last two weeks, we saw the debut of Scarlet Bordeaux versus Katarina, which is a good match, um, and it plays into the storyline that's been going on right now. And we saw Diamante versus Sue Young. So, I mean, two high-profile matches that should have gotten at least some advertising. I mean, I think they need to do a little more with Explosion, maybe get two matches on there, because, I mean, they are taping a bunch of dark matches, for i think the crowd in the rebel complex at least they didn't there um but i think that should be something they should look into maybe expanding it a little more make it more relevant now because i mean i think they have like an old match that they play during it so i just think that should be how they should be advertising their network is with current stuff that people will be interested in seeing after watching the show but hey what do i know and then we get a promo for the Mexican tape, Mexican tapings, the Mexico tapings taking place on September 13th and 14th. Um, that should be interesting. Uh, I believe CMLL is running a show the same day or at night, and the impact tapings are taking place in the afternoon. So the turnout should be very interesting. Uh, looking forward to those. Uh, I've heard rumors of La Park possibly coming to impact. So. I think uh, we're going to get a lot of good stuff during those tapings. Then we find out that Richie is not dead. He will make a full recovery. He is in the hospital right now. He is the little kid that got hit by uh, King and the OGs last week, which had some people up in arms. Uh, My only issue with the whole thing is that I I didn't think it was necessary. I mean, they could have ended it there with the whole LAX OG feud, at least for the time being. LAX got their tag titles back. But it got a little interesting later on. Um, We actually go backstage now, and we see Hernandez feeling some remorse about the incident with Richie. King flips out, telling them not to get soft on him. King's phone rings. He's very apprehensive to answer it. He kind of looks at it. He answers it. Then he tells the OGs not to make a move until he gives them the green light. And uh, we get a similar segment with Conan later on. So I don't know where we're going with this. It was Sir. There was an um, 
you know, I didn't know if maybe this was going to bring Diamante back into the picture, but I believe when Conan was on the phone later on, he did say sir, so that that should be interesting. Um, I'm wondering if we're just going to get them as one giant group in the future, but looking forward to where that is going. We had a Tessa interview. She was being interviewed by Alicia. Uh, Alicia asks if she's feeling pressured tonight. Tessa says she's always pressured. She has so much to live up to. Being a Blanchard isn't enough unless you have something to show for it. Um, so up next, we have Eli Drake coming out, and uh, he talks about being followed around by the Cult of Lee and how they were defeated by two guys last week who didn't even know they were going to wrestle. He brings those two men out. Eli kind of talks about them, how they're hometown boys, stuff like that. He sends an open challenge out to the two of them. Mr. Atlantis accepts it. So Eli says he's going to face the other guy, who is Brandon Tidwell. Um, Eli defeats Tidwell very quickly, and he hits the gravy train, and then he hits one on Mr. Atlantis for good measure. So I guess next week we're going to have some sort of Eli Drake open challenge. Um, I mean, the segment wasn't bad. It I don't know, it really didn't do too much for me. It's just a shame that Eli's not doing anything bigger at the moment. Uh, I mean, it is a treat to see Eli out because his interaction with the crowd is always so good, and it's very enjoyable. Uh, he's just such a good character, and I know a lot of people wish he was doing more right now. But let's be patient. Hopefully he has a lot in the future. Uh, then we got Alicia interviewing Moose and Eddie Edwards. Moose tells Eddie that he has his back. And Eddie talks about cracking them over the head with his kendo stick. And then we get the knockout championship match. Sue Young defending against Allie and Tessa. Um, this match was a little underwhelming, unfortunately. I mean, they didn't give it too much time. We had a handful of good spots between the three women. We had a nice submission maneuver with all three. Uh, where Tessa had Allie in a modified Indian deathlock, and while Sue had put Tessa into the arm bar. So that was interesting. O outside of a couple of spots, it really wasn't too much. Uh, we saw Sue Young put the claw on Allie. Allie hits her with a code breaker. And then Tessa comes in and rolls up Allie for the victory, and we have a new knockouts champion. Um, unfortunately, the crowd didn't seem too excited. At least that's how it was on tv maybe the reaction at the rebel complex was much better when it was live um but i don't know where they go from here uh i believe they said that Su young is going to get her rematch next week so they're gonna go there um i don't know if they're gonna continue the feud between the two of them because it seems like they haven't built up too many people that would be a good enough i guess competitor against Tessa for the knockout championship, and that's not taking anything away from the women. It's just the way they've been building them up. Um, she's had something with Allie. She's had something with Kiera. Uh, we had a match with her and Alicia. Madison Rain, she's gone. I don't think she'll be back. It, it seems like the knockouts division has been kind of depleted. Uh, Katarina's probably not going to get into it. Scarlett's doing her own thing. I believe we're going to see something between the two of them. Um... Who else do we got? Not not much. I mean, the only thing that would make sense is have uh, Taya come back and maybe turn her face and have the two of them have a decent little feud. Um, but like I said, I mean, I really enjoyed Sue Young's title reign. She didn't wrestle too much, but the character work they did with her was so good. Um, she always had the advantage with all the undead bridesmaids at ringside. She, she was booked well, so... Like I said, I don't think she needs the title because she's a big enough character. But again, I don't know what they're going to do with her. If they keep her and Tessa together, that should be interesting. But outside that, I guess we will just have to wait and see after next week. So we head backstage and we see Gama Singh carrying a broom around looking for the hit squad. He eventually finds them, starts yelling at them, and then beats them with the broom. So uh, yeah, there was that. He is very disappointed in them with losing, what, two in a row, I think it was. So so we get another interview, this time with Killer Cross and Ares. Uh, Cross makes a hint that someone may not make it out to the ring because there's a long distance between the back and the ring. 
Uh, Ares says, nobody is safe now that he has aligned himself with Killer Cross. They're changing Impact Wrestling, and there is nothing anybody can do about it. So there was that. And then we get a promotion for MediaCon, which they have live on Twitch September 9th. So that, I believe, is next Sunday that I'm looking forward to. Uh, then we go backstage, and we see LAX is half. They are besides themselves about the condition of Richie and how he's in the hospital. Um, Conan's phone rings. He is confused. Conan says not to do anything until he gives them the green light. So much like the OG segment, um, we wonder if there is someone higher than King and Conan here. So now we get the segment with the smoke show, and this is Scarlet with Grado, Joe Hendry, and Katarina. Um, Scarlet makes the joke and saying, with the three of them sitting down, that this is a sexy menage a trois, which Grado starts flipping out, uh, saying that he knew it, and Joe starts to calm him down, and he ensures that next week when they face the Desi Hit Squad, he will explain, or he has a song to explain everything. Now, I know a lot of people aren't a fan of Grado, and I get it, and I could have done without seeing his stomach hanging out uh, during the smoke show, but... He really does play the character very well, so I have to give him that. And this was entertaining. I, I like the smoke show. I think they're doing something good here and something different um, than your normal show that they have. So I, I like it. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with it. Like I said, the other Scarlet segments don't do too much for me, but these I do like. So anyway, uh, Katarina explains that her and Grader are in love, and Joe is just a very good friend. Scarlet at this point goes over to Grado and whispers in his ear. Grado's holding a water bottle. He squeezes it. Water goes everywhere. He gets excited. He's like, oh, that usually never happens. Uh, he storms off. Joe follows him. And then Katarina and Scarlet are left alone. Uh, Katarina tells Scarlet to keep her grubby little mitts to herself and don't try to come between me and my boys. Katarina leaves and Scarlet says, it looks like I already have. So... This would be interesting if they go the route with Katarina and Scarlet because on that match with in on Explosion, which I, I thought it was a good match, and it was funny because there was some interaction between Scarlet and Grado, so I, I think that would be a good way to debut her, um, and it'll keep or continue the rift between all three of them. So then we have P.D. Williams versus Rich Swan. This was a good little match, not nothing too crazy. Good back and forth. Good amount of countering. We got a handful of near falls, but Rich Swan ended up picking up the victory after hitting a standing shooting star press, and he kind of caught PD by surprise. Um, like I said, nothing crazy here. Good little match. Uh, then we go backstage, and Rich Swan is backstage, and he says that he needs a few more victories, and that'll catapult him to the X Division Championship. Matt Seidel interrupts, and he says he doesn't think Rich can do it himself, so he offers his services. Uh, Rich denies them, and at this point, we hear Alicia scream, and we see Moose laid out on the ground. Killer Cross, his calling card is on top of him. Um, so yeah, it looks like we are going to have a handicap match for the main event, but as far as Seidel versus Rich Swan, uh, I am completely on board. If they have a program together, even just a match would be good. Um, but yeah, so that gives the, both of them something to do, hopefully. And that brings us to our main event, Austin Aries and Killer Cross versus Eddie Edwards. And originally it was supposed to be Moose as his tag team partner, but we saw just before that Moose was laid up backstage. Um, so, yeah, this was kind of your typical handicap match with Edwards just getting his ass kicked most of the time. He had little flashes of offense, attacking the guy on the apron and then attacking the guy in the ring. Uh, numbers game's too much for him. We eventually see Moose make his way out. Ares goes to tag in Killer Cross. Killer Cross drops off the apron. Says, no, 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 no. Have fun. Moose gets tagged in. Moose comes in. Waits to attack Ares. I think he grabs him. And all of a sudden, he turns around and hits Eddie Edwards with a spear. Uh, Killer Cross is like, tells Ares, see, this is what it was all about. The three men beat the crap out of Edwards, put a chair around his neck. Uh, I think they hit him with a chair on the outside, hitting one chair that was around his neck with another chair. Alicia comes out. She slaps Moose and tends to Eddie. 
And that's the end of the show. Um, so I don't know if this is Moose kind of saying, if you can't beat him, you might as well join him, or he's sick and tired of being on the losing end, so he wants to align himself with some powerful friends to uh, get his, I guess, his career in the, the right direction. Um, but it should be interesting. We kind of came out of nowhere. I didn't expect this. Um, I do like the idea of turning Moose heel. It should be interesting because I don't know how much he's been a heel. And, I mean, his most recent stuff has been kind of bland, nothing too crazy. Um, Eddie Edwards, I, I just hope they keep the crazy side to him. Um, I, I don't want him to see him go into the whole white meat, vanilla, baby face, um, which he was in the past, so because he has had a lot of character development, so I, I hope that's the way they go with this. Um, but yeah, that that was uh, redefined. Overall, good show. Um, I tried something a little different, using my webcam to record rather than the camcorder. I have a whole bunch of new stuff I'm going to try for the page. I'm going to plan on doing monthly power rankings. I'm going to have WWE vs. Impact Wrestling Dream Match videos coming soon. I got a whole bunch of stuff planned out. Um, but... Thanks for taking time out of your day to check out my video. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments section below. Maybe even just let me know of some videos you'd like to see done that haven't been done by other people. So I will catch you guys back on Sunday for the Impact Report. And until then, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks, guys. Bye.